So welcome to another episode of the Leadership Enigma. And we know that we are living and leading and decision-making in the delta of change. We're surrounded by volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. But ethics is a big piece of how we lead and how we make decisions. So this episode is about ethical decision-making. And so you have to come back to me because I have Dr. Trumaine Dupreez. And I say that because I'm really happy that she's coming back for the second time to the Leadership Enigma. She's a global educator, author, and friend. And now that she's got her doctorate, she's a decision scientist. So come back to us just after this. You're listening to The Leadership Enigma, powered by Transform Performance International, a podcast for the insatiably curious to explore the power of human-centered leadership to create real momentum for positive and sustainable change. Whether you're an entrepreneur, business owner, or corporate executive, each week we speak to global experts, academics, rising stars, ambitious upstarts, and disruptors as we discover that success leaves clues. Now, here's your host, Adam Pacifico. Hi, Jermaine. For the second time, the Leadership Enigma. You're back. Hey, Adam. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. I was so excited that you were coming back. And I know that you've told a little bit of your story when we were together for episode one. But for anyone who hasn't heard that episode, and I'd ask you to go back and listen to the first episode that I, well, we did together, just give us a, a little idea of how you got to Dr. Tremaine Dupree's decision scientist. Well, you were partly to blame for that. Um, uh -oh. I, I will start there. <laughs> and you introduced me to a, a mid-sized pharmaceutical company that was having some challenges. I remember. Um, yep. And, and they found that they had everything in place uh, in terms of codes of conduct and codes of ethics, uh, but they were still not happy that it was enough to help their colleagues, their, their employees make the best possi possible decisions when it came to ethical dilemmas. And they had spoken to ethicists and professors and consultants and got the best possible advice around ethics, but there was a missing piece. Um, and up until that point, I'd been in the field of decision making for more than a decade. And so they wanted somebody who could really understand what was involved in the decision side of ethical decision making. And for me, all sorts of light bulbs went on working in that project. And up until then, I thought ethics was a separate thing that other people will take care of. And I'll just focus on decision making. But the realization, of course, is that you can't. Ethics is about decision making and you can't make great decisions without considering, considering ethics as well. So this is hand in glove stuff, really, isn't it? So was that was that project what steered you towards doing your doctorate on ethical decision making or was there a wider piece? No, that was it. That It was so profound and so life changing and so unique, the work that we did together. I realized we created something new and original. Um, and, and it really spoke to my way of working and then it was practical. I wasn't interested in doing a doctorate in theory because that's not gonna help anyone make better decisions. There's enough of that out there. This was something we did in practice and we could see it work and we could see how it was influencing the quality of organizational decision-making. So what was the eureka moment for you then that this was so inextricably linked or because it's very now, yeah. it, it's always been very now maybe, but, but what was the eureka moment for you that I've got to put these two things together and specialize in that. Well, well, firstly, that the fields of ethics and decision making have developed separately, quite right. separately. Um, and that to me was just crazy because what I really realized was that ethics is not about doing the right thing. In fact, it's really helping people solve tough choices. And, and within that, understanding that the impacts of their choices will be different on different stakeholders. Okay. And what risks will arise from that, understanding those, and then deciding which of these risks and which of these impacts resonate with my values and which of these can I live with? So it, this it, is a lovely, oh, sorry, Terrain. So this is a lovely segue, isn't it? Because I was going to ask the question, what is an ethical decision? Because I think you've, you've got a three point answer to this. And I think this is going to be incredibly relevant and transferable to, to people listening to this. So let's start with that. What is an ethical decision? 
Well, firstly, it is one that can identify that we're actually dealing with an ethical dilemma. Right. And from my research, we know that this was actually quite a tough choice to answer or quite a tough idea to get our head around what is an ethical dilemma. Okay. Um, so we know that universally around the world, it consists of at least three characteristics. Number one is that it breaches a core value. Now that could be my core value. It could be the organization's core value. It could be our society's core value. Um, so we have this, this, this thing where people say it doesn't feel right. There's that element because it's, it's, it's jarring with something that we, we, we value. Okay. And that can be personal and organizational. Absolutely. And we'll talk about that in a minute because there's sometimes a gap between these two things. Right. Um, and the second thing is there's no clear answer. If there was, we'd go and speak to compliance and they'd give us the answer. Um, or we'd look for precedent and we'd understand what the answer would be. Gotcha. Um, so like with most dilemmas, there is no clear answer. And thirdly, there are unequal stakeholder impacts. And this is really where the dilemma lies in that different stakeholders are impacted differently. So it's those three key elements that, that allow us to identify an ethical dilemma. And then we simply move into decision-making best practice. Right. But with this values overlay. Okay, so we've got three elements. It breaches a core value. There's no right answer, and it impacts all the stakeholders unequally. Well, there are right. unequal impacts on stakeholders. Maybe it's all of them. Maybe it's one or two. Right, got you. Uh, and this is interesting, isn't it? Because you and I uh, have worked together on a number of projects, and I know that leaders, when they think about decisions and ethical decisions, they're very clear when it's black and white. But it's this ever-expanding grey area that people are operating in and leading in. That's the fuzzy part, isn't it? Absolutely. And, and that is where ethics sits today, and, and which is why I was startled that decision-making and ethics have so far been separate. And, and, and also startling that up until now, I hadn't come across this. Okay, I'm from the world of finance, and it is moving towards ethical decision-making. <laughs> but you know, in many other industries, this is front and center. Um, so really, really important, the, these gray areas and understanding risk within these gray areas and, and looking at not in terms of shareholder value creation, yep. as we traditionally do, um, but actually broadening that out into stakeholder value creation and actually understanding how we create value from stakeholders throughout the value creation chain, not just for shareholders, because quite frankly, how we are being judged, how consumers are consuming today is changing. And the way they trust organizations and leaders is also changing. So tell me something, we're obviously coming through a global pandemic. So that's a shared experience, but it's also been a very individual experience. Is there something you can point to that's been, this might be wrong, a classic ethical decision that we've all seen that an organization has had to make that they've been grappling with? Well, could you point to anything that you would say is a, is a real ethical dilemma that's been sitting out there for a while? Now, that, that's interesting because the, I've worked with several clients through the pandemic and, and they've been in different industries and different industries have grappled with different issues. Right. But the companies that are, are trying their hardest to live up to their values and, and using them as that North Star are actually finding that it's not enough. Okay. So let, let's say that we, we tell our staff to do the right thing and we believe in being transparent. So a lot of people, when a lot, a lot of organizations, when they're really stuck, they go back to these values. Let's do the right thing and let's be transparent. Yep. The problem is that we're not always clear on what it means to do the right thing. And, and again, through, through my doctorate, through the research, we interviewed employees from all around the world, from Japan to South America to Europe, North America, there wasn't a single definition of doing the right thing that rang true for every culture, every society, every geographic. And this was startling because we are dealing with multinational companies who tell their staff to do the right thing. Right. And we trust you to do the right thing. And yet what, what we believe doing the right thing can be is, is quite different. So this is really interesting. Um, and I found that now that we're in the pandemic, and we are removed, you know, the decision making is decentralized. Mm -hmm. um, and we're relying on people to make ethical choices. But we're not giving them practical guidance on how to make those ethical choices. 
we're giving them codes and these high level ideas, these principles, principle based codes. And we're just accepting that they will go off and know what to do. And, and sometimes we see when we increase the emphasis on ethics and we shine a spotlight on ethics, the quality of decision making decreases. And this to me is also fascinating. Wow. Because people become afraid, they don't know what the right answer is. They know there's a clash of values, but it might just be my value and, and not the person in the cubicle next to me. It, it might not bother them. Um, so we really, we, as we push further into these murky areas, certainly during the pandemic, we have found that the more of an emphasis we put on ethics without providing that support around it, the worse off our staff are in terms of confidence in their own decision making. So that's something that I've definitely seen um, as we are, right. as we're introducing decision agility and getting people to, to make decisions far further down the line than we would have done with a centralized organization. So Tremaine, I'm drawing a comparison with corporate values because sometimes people struggle with understanding how do they live a value on a day to day basis because it's a word on a wall or a screen or a piece of paper, but they haven't worked out for themselves how that impacts them day to day in their role in their division and in their business is am I drawing a comparison that's, that's relevant now when we talk about ethical decision making. Absolutely. So a value is generally a poster on a wall, right? Yeah. Something on the website that a consultant or the marketing department came up with or senior leaders and decided these are our values. And we have to have them and they unite us and everybody must agree to them. But they don't specify the behaviors that underline those values. Right. So again, you know, doing the right thing. What, what are the behaviors in this organization? What does it mean to do the right thing? And, you know, I've worked now since completing my doctorate, I've, I've worked with several large organizations and I've asked them this question and they can't agree. And, and these are the senior leaders. So if me as an employee sitting, you know, as a clerk working in an office removed from head office, how do I know what is the right thing to do? How do I know how to live that value? So by defining the behaviors under that, the priorities, that surround those behaviors as well. Um, right. You know, are we, are we focused on profit? Are we focused on the environment? Are we focused on caring? Um, are we focused on, we, you know, even if we look at um, sort of traditional ethics theories, they don't even help us here either. You know, we can say that we're, we're focused on virtues and values, but then what about the greater good argument? Should, can we do something that's not so good, but it benefits a great number of people? And, and some people are, are adversely impacted. Um, so there's, you know, there, there's lots of ideas around ethics, but there's very few behaviors that actually help us live these values. In many ways, this is adding to the many dilemmas that a leader has on a day-to-day -day basis. It's, it's a hell of a dilemma, actually, isn't it, really? So I, I want to move into asking you, what kinds of mistakes are you seeing leaders make? And it sounds like one of them might be that they're not going into enough granularity in order for people to understand how to make these decisions. But what are, what are some of the, the mistakes you're seeing in your research? Absolutely, uh, but both in my research and in my consulting practice. Yep. Um, so number one, I think, is that telling people to do the right thing. Just don't do it. Actually, I, I would recommend completely removing it from your code of ethics and right. spelling out what does it mean to do the right thing in this organization? What are the behaviors that underlie it, right? Um, th the next thing I would say is that there is this assumption that ethics and compliance go together. Okay. Because you have the ENC department, ethics and compliance. Mm -hmm. Now, compliance traditionally is about rules. And, and it's a little bit like um, coming to a four way stop in the traffic. And the traffic light can be red, orange, or green. And you know, no, go, don't go, or just, you know, proceed with caution. But when it comes to ethics, it's a little bit like getting to one of those crazy roundabouts in the UK where you have to make a judgment based on all the information you can gather about the other drivers, your position, the, you know, is the road dry or slippery, and you have to decide when to go at what speed. Okay. These are two different things. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm seeing more and more, and it was something that we did in our research as well, was asking people when you're faced with an ethical dilemma, what you believe is an ethical dilemma, who do you speak to? And eight out of 10 respondents do not go to ethics and compliance. Interesting. And that was remarkable. 
they go to someone they trust. Right. So there's a real trust issue there. Yeah. And it's not because they don't trust ethics and compliance, but because their experience with ethics and compliance is rules based. It's not gray and murky and and partnering in this intense decision discovery process. It isn't. I assume um, they're nervous as well, Tremaine, yeah. of taking something like that, maybe to ethics and compliance. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and you know, there's a couple more things that, that I see. And another one is the assumption that you don't need to train ethics because you hire good people. So th there is this, this maxim in, in ethics training that you don't need to do it because those who would use it don't need it. Right. And those who wouldn't use it, well, they, they wouldn't use it anyway. You're wasting your time with them. Um, but that's not true. And, and certainly in the work that I do, we actually look at it from that decision dilemma point of view. And we look at it from a point of view of being ethical is simply not enough, not with the challenges that leaders face today. You can be the best possible person, but still not know how to proceed. Right. Not know what tools to actually marshal to help you make the best possible decision. Um, so I think, I think that, you know, there I'm still seeing, even in large organizations, we don't need ethics training because we hire good people. Um, but you're not doing them any favors by leaving them there without support. Okay, so as the world gets more complicated, that's a real risk in itself, isn't it? If you're thinking, I don't need to give the people who are part of the business ethical training, that's got to be a risk, hasn't it? Yeah, for sure. So what are you seeing companies are doing well at this? Yeah. What are you seeing in them, the ones that are getting it right, or maybe not getting it right, but they're on the path to getting it right. They understand the challenge and they're making great effort to try and resolve it. What, what are they doing that we should be replicating or aware of? Sure. Um, and, you know, I'm fortunate to work with some companies who are really leading in this field. Okay. Um, the first thing I see them doing is actually not getting consultants in to tell <laughs> them how to be ethical. Um, I am getting, I'm seeing them actually going to their organizations and say, what does ethics look like to us? What does it look like to you sitting far removed from head office? And what does it look like to us at head office? Hearing the voices, because, you know, building an ethical muscle or an ethical mindset is cultural, right? It's, it really speaks to culture and values. Um, so they're, they're building these codes of ethics or ethical decision-making guidelines. They're building them collectively. And, and I think that is that is unique and, and fantastic. Um, I've got a question for you there. The yes. when, you say, when you say they're, they're building this collectively, how far and wide are they going or should they go? Because you've got the, the newest intern and you've got the CEO and everything in between. Where do they go to get that diversity of thought? Well, we've actually gone to representative samples of the organization. So we've divided the organization up into, you know, we look at years of experience in the industry. We look at years of experience in the company. Mm -hmm. We look at regions and we actually say, all right, how do we build a representative sample of this company? And then we don't necessarily ask for volunteers because then you get people who are interested in ethics. <laughs> what we want is people who go, that's a load of hogwash. You know, ethics is about integrity. You either got it or you don't. Uh, I get that no answer sense. a lot. Yeah. Do you um, still? You get that a lot. Yes. Yes. Wow. Um, and we want those people and we want the people who go, I need to know more because I'm not sure, you know, how to do this ethics thing in this organization. Um, so it's about, you know, really building a good sample of people and then inviting people to participate in questionnaires, um, without judgment. So this really, you know, when you, when it comes to ethics, you, you want to be clear that you're not judging. So you, you want it as far as possible, um, to be done through third parties so right. that we don't know who's responding. Um, so we really want to get some information, you know, how do people identify ethical dilemmas? How do they already go about resolving them? Because we don't want to change the way, way the company works, but we want to improve it. So we want to take how things happen already and then enhance it. Now, um, now people who get this wrong, let's be honest, at a senior level, that can actually be career limiting, can't it? So I, I'm, the phrase in my mind at the moment is psychological safety there's got to be a high degree of psychological safety for people to operate within this environment and talk about ethics, uh, make decisions about ethics and seek guidance and advice when necessary. So is that a fair comment? Psychological safety is important for the organization. Do you know that the one thing, the answer is yes. And, right. and the, the one thing 
the, the, the biggest obstacle to developing an ethical mindset in an organization is a lack of shared language. Tell me more. And a lack of an ability and a space to actually talk about ethics. Your know, ethics is an intangible. And for some people, you may be in a scientific environment or a financial environment where you can't necessarily quantify it, although we're more and more able to quantify ethics um, financially um, and in terms of trust and, 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 um, and purchasing decisions. But this ability to actually say, right, we want to talk about the ethics of this decision now. We actually, we have language to talk about it. Um, so this creates psychological safety. And another aspect of psychological safety is the ability to call out the difference or discrepancies between personal and organizational values. Because you may have some cultures that are collective, some cultures that are individual, um, some cultures that focus far more on relationships mm -hmm. than on individual success. And for them, there may be a difference between what the company expects of them and what their personal values are. How do they talk about that? Because this changes, you know, we, we are the first and foremost stakeholder in our decisions, and we will always consider the impacts on ourselves first and foremost. So if we don't allow for that in decision-making or ethical decision-making, we're going to run into problems and, we, and this will increase risk. Um, so, so that's another aspect of psychological safety. So this is interesting as well, because companies sometimes are accused of hiring in their own image and not having the diversity or the diversity of thought. And there can be a rub, can't there, between personal values and organizational values, then that doesn't have to be cataclysmic for the two coming together. I'm assuming people can have disparate values and still work in the organization. Is that, a, is that, is that right? It, it, it's helpful. I mean, you don't want somebody who is fundamentally against your organizational values. They simply wouldn't be a good fit. Yeah, but they right. may have values that that create a different lens through which to see the problem or to see the challenge. And in fact, if you look at the, the definition of ethical, it comes from the Greek word ethos, which means right. character. And moral, on the other hand, is from the Latin mos, which means custom. So being ethical and, and, and having the values that drive ethics, it, it was never about you know, making good decisions and doing the right thing. It was always about being a good character in line with the customs of the day. But as we know, customs change, values change, what people think is important and accepted changes. So if you have a group of employees or senior leaders from one particular demographic with one particular group of values, you're gonna miss the changes. So I have and, another question for yeah. you as well. Forgive me for interrupting. I, I'm making notes feverishly as we go, aren't I? Um, I'm also thinking that this focus on ethics and ethical decision-making is something that's got to be constant fluid, not let's do it. And then we'll revisit in 12 months because the operating environment isn't going to sit still long enough. Yep. So, so what is the best approach um, for an organization embracing this now moving forward and hopefully beyond the global pandemic? Sure, sure. And, you know, I'll go back to what I'm seeing companies that are getting this right, what I'm seeing them doing is they are bringing it to life as part of their ways of working. Right. So I have one company that did the most amazing thing. They built a library of ethical dilemmas. It's a living library, right? And, and they've realized that somebody in perhaps supply chain can't, can't relate to an ethical dilemma that was faced by somebody in research. So what they do is they constantly reach out to the organization and say, hey, come chat to us about the ethical dilemmas that you face something that you're willing to share. They run it via legal, of course. Yep. Um, and then they build this library so that me as an employee, I can go, I'm really stuck. I'm not ready to speak to anyone about it, but I'm gonna tap into this library and I'm gonna find something that resonates with either my dilemma or my department, my area of expertise. And this, this is truly sort of cutting edge um, in that they're opening themselves up to say, right, we, we're willing to share we're building an environment of trust. We're willing, willing to be vulnerable, but we also know how difficult it is to explore ethical dilemmas. Um, so it, it's living. And, you know, we can't really have this conversation without talking about that. You know, it sounds cliche tone at the top, but if your leaders aren't willing to live the values, to constantly talk about the ethical challenges that they have, then you might as well not do any of this. 
Um, and, and you said earlier, didn't you, that this is inextricably linked to an organization's culture? Yes. So I know the company you're talking about, so it, it's nice to see and hear that that's been so successful within it. So what's next for ethics? That's a wide question as well, isn't it? But what is next? It, it is really wide. Um, and funny enough, perversely, I think that ethics and the adoption of ethics is, is actually going to be driven by commercial uh, factors and forces. And that takes us back to trust. Right. And if we look at the definition of trust over time, uh, and the Edelman Trust Barometer, their 2020 survey has got a fantastic section yes. of, on, on how trust has changed and the definition of trust has changed. And we start with, I trust you because you're a little bit like me and, and you're competent. So if you make dishwashers, you're going to make a good dishwasher, it's going to clean the dishes and it's going to last. But today, that has gone from being the greatest measure of trust to only 24% of what defines trust between between uh, citizens and governments, yep. between uh, customers and companies, etc. cetera. Um, where we are now is that ethical attributes define the remaining 76%. Right. And, and trust is the second most important purchasing consideration after price. Wow. And that gap is closing. So as companies go, hang on, we've got a trust deficit and it is affecting our bottom line, they're going to start looking at how do we do this ethics thing? And it's going to be driven far more practically and into those behaviors and, and, and just how do we wrestle with this at a very, very practical level. That will focus the mind, won't it? It will. <laughs> now, I know that this has become, a, a, this is a passionate focus for you. So how can people listening to this get in contact with you to get your help? Sure, I'm at uh, Decide, the decision-making consultancy. And if you Google decideconsultancy.com, I am, contact details are available there. There is LinkedIn, Tremaine Dupuis, um, and there's all the, the many consultancies and companies that I work with as well. Right, gotcha. Now, when you did the first episode a while ago, I may have asked you some, some crazy questions to end with. Oh, yes. Do you remember this? Do you remember these questions? I don't remember what they were, but- Do you not? What, they made I, me think. They did, but I, I don't know whether I asked you this question. So if I did, I'm going to go and check your answer from the last one. And if you didn't, it's great. So I want to know what would be your best advice to a 21-year-old Tremaine? I do know the answer to that. And no, you didn't ask me that before. Um, okay, but you know the answer. I do know the answer. And, and it wasn't advice that I got. When, when I finished my Viva in my doctorate, um, the, the, the lady who chaired my panel said to me, you can now go out and own the space. You don't need to be any older. You don't need to be any wiser. You don't need to be anything more. You are enough. And that was so profound in my thinking. You know, I, I write all these books and I do all these degrees all to, for what reason? And actually it's all just to change my own mind about the value that I can bring. Um, so, and, and you know, I, I will certainly thank her for that really life-changing advice. And that's good advice that anybody can grab with both hands, I would suggest. Oh, <laughs> you can hear the popping in my ear. Jermaine, thank you so much for being a superstar on the Leadership Enigma. I think I'm going to twist your arm and you can get to come back again and give us a bit of an update in relation to ethical decision making. See what happens with this? Anytime, Adam. Thank you for having me. Join us again next week for more essential insights on the Leadership Enigma. We'd love to hear your comments on today's show, as well as suggestions for future topics and guests. Get in touch with your host on LinkedIn or via our website, www.pca-global.com. Please don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes. Thanks for listening. Join us again next week for more tips and strategies on the Leadership Enigma. We'd love to hear your comments on today's show as well as suggestions for future topics and guests. Get in touch with your host on LinkedIn or visit the dedicated website, www.leadersenigma.com, powered by Transform Performance International, where you can access our exclusive learning, including books, videos, bonus content, assessments, and more. Please don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe on all your major podcast platforms. Thanks for listening.